for making time to talk to me today. I uh, would love to kind of learn more about um, your work with Liquid Democracy. What, uh, before we start, what is Liquid Democracy? Yeah, so Liquid Democracy is the broad, is a term describing this sort of broad reimagining of what democratic representation has the potential to become now that we live in this digitally connected age. So it's really rethinking um, what can a more trustworthy, accountable, inclusive, and smarter democratic representative system look like in the 21st century. Talk to me about your journey, um, you know, kind of in the democracy space. What led you to this? Uh, what was your motivation? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've always, I, I almost think of it as like a, as like a, um, a bug that some of us have. I think you, you, you and I both share this where like we, we, we're so closely paying attention to everything that's happening, even though it's, can feel so frustrating and we as individuals can feel so powerless. So for as long as I can remember, you know, I've voraciously um, tried to keep up with, with current events in my local community, in the regional community, in the nationwide community, and in the global community. And a lot of times it can be rather um, disheartening. And so at the same time, that that's sort of my like, political background, if you will. I also in my family, there's a lot of political involvement. So my, um, my parents were both attorneys for the in public office at one point, my mom was a civil rights attorney at the Justice Department. My father was the city attorney for the city of Dallas, and oversaw all the uh, municipal law and some prosecutorial law and all sorts of other things. And, and even my grandfather was a state senator and but there's like a crazy story where he like technically ran as a third party candidate um, for president, but that's a whole nother story. So, so I just like sort of immersed in this stuff from a young age and like sitting around the dinner table, we'd always be talking about the latest scandal or what have you. But then my interest has always been in the power of technology and in the ability for, um, for a few creative people to come up with new tools and ways of doing things and the, just being able to get something out there that can very quickly reach millions of people and really change things in powerful ways at, yeah, at extreme scale and ideally for, for good. I mean, technology is just a tool like anything. It just gives you leverage. And so some people are using it for good and some people for bad. And so, yeah, just um, seeing that overlap or seeing the potentials in that overlap has long been an area that I've been interested in. And then it was in early 2016, getting connected with you, getting connected with other collaborators that we were starting to look at, okay, what are the specific things that we can do? I had made some little tools to like remind people about upcoming primaries and, and upcoming chances to vote. And the response has been really positive. And then we started looking at um, how can we use some of the, the new technology, especially around um, cryptographically verifiable distributed systems, decentralized systems, to create um, the infrastructure for people to feel like their voice is being heard in a much more trustworthy way. That was sort of the... the entry point and then from there just exploring these fields and exploring the ideas that were already out there and then uh, getting reacquainted and more deeply acquainted with this liquid dem democratic model and really this idea of peer-to-peer -peer representation you get to pick your own representative as an upgrade over the 17th century or 1776 version of we're going to have one person that from our community that goes off to the capital on the other side of the country um, and, and just rethinking how that system could be 
radically improved, massively improved, 10x better, 100x better for today's world. Um, yeah, I mean, once once the ideas were put in front of me and kind of got in the back of my mind, I'd be talking about it with friends like like you and talking about it with other people. And it was just incredible the amount of enthusiasm that other people would reflect back as well. Explain to people what was now possible and, and seeing people's eyes light up and the things that people will say, like, oh my God, that's, you know, that's incredible. You, people would be practically begging, you have to do this, please. You know, when can we do this? I want this right now. Um, yeah, the, just the, the level, it, it so clearly struck a chord in people, but it was very challenging because there's such high um, technical challenges to overcome to do it in an easy to use and reliable way. And at the same time, just uh, like organizational political challenges to overcome to get it to reach enough people. Um, there's sort of the sense of like, how can this be so, so powerful and people be so excited about it? and yet it not be out there already? How come it, this hasn't already caught on more widely? And the sense that I came to, the conclusion that I reached was that people wanted it. The vast majority of people didn't know it was possible, didn't know it existed, didn't know it wasn't even an option. Once they were introduced to it, then they wanted it. But then even though they wanted it, they weren't sure how to actually express that. It, it, it's very difficult. Like, what's the next step? What do you, what do you actually do? And so making it as easy as possible for people to get started and begin experimenting with these ideas and begin pushing these ideas forward and, and becoming a part of it as well. That seemed like something that I personally could help contribute to as somebody that's built technology for, for large scale communities. And that's, yeah, that's, that's basically how I got into it. Long that's a great segue actually. Um, so, so kind of to give people a sense for what it is, uh, who don't have a background, um, maybe a, a nice way to, to introduce them is, I understand you, well, I know that you ran for office um, on a liquid democracy platform. Um, maybe, maybe you could give us kind of the pitch for, um, for what you were doing uh, as a candidate, and, and that might be a, a way to kind of use, you know, what are the nitty gritties of liquid democracy? What does it mean? What is, what is the technology used for? What's, what's it supposed to do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it. so again, at a high level, it's all about how can we represent people as faithfully as possible and with as much accountability as possible and as much trust as possible. To make it more specific, what that means is um, right now we have the system where we think of our representatives as the people that are elected to office who want to erase for office and they get to vote on behalf of tens of thousands of us or hundreds of thousands of us or millions of us in the case of Congress. And it's that one person is now the, the voice of a million people, you know, to any one Congress person. And that's, that can be incredibly powerful, but it's also, it's a, um, it was like a limitation of the tools that were available when the current system was developed 250 years ago. Whereas what we can do now, so the very simple, um, the very simple opportunity that some people have, have hit upon and started talking about is, oh, everybody could just vote directly. You, know, you could have an app on your pocket. Everyone could be voting on all the things that Congress is voting on. And this is not a new idea by any means. Um, there's polling that shows something like 50% of Americans are actually in favor of moving to more of a system like this. A huge, a huge number of people. And there's talk like Elon Musk has said, oh, when we have our Mars colony, this is how we'll do it. Everyone will have an app. And there's other books and, and movies and media that describe this world. The problem with that, it's, it's powerful in some ways, but it's not perfect by any means. And the biggest problem with it that I take is that it suggests that representation isn't a valuable thing. Whereas I, I think representation is an incredibly valuable thing being able to trust that there are people out there speaking on behalf of the things that I care about, that we care about advocating for our values and really trying to understand the nitty gritty of the issues, that's an immensely powerful thing. Which quite frankly, we're all very busy 
we barely have enough time to handle the responsibilities we have in our own lives to expect millions of people to pour over legislation or, or intricacies of policy details. It's just unrealistic. And it's, it's not, um, yeah, I'm not sure you'd actually get the ideals are there, but it's not clear that you actually get the practical outcomes that you want. And so liquid democracy starts from seeing these two ends of the spectrum. Like, should we have these full-time elected representatives on one end or should everyone be able to vote directly? And it says, what if you could have both? So can you get the best of both worlds? And quite frankly, what that means is each and every last person can always represent themselves on any issue they want. They can say, I'm in favor of this new policy. I'm in favor of this new law. I'm in favor of spending our collective money this way or that way. And on top of that, you say, look, anytime I don't vote, this is who I trust to be my representative. Almost more like a backup. So it's like, just like if I wasn't at my house, you know, I'm going on a trip, I want someone to water my plants or take care of my pets or pick up my mail. You know, these are the people that I trust to represent me. And the same way, these are the people that I trust in government to represent me. And the really powerful thing is that that's your personal choice. It's no longer, right now our system is, we have this cage match. We say, okay, six people put their name down as candidates for office, one of them can win. And so they have to fight each other and beat each other up and attack each other for months and months and months. And they're all bruised and one person comes out as the representative and a liquid democratic system, you can say, look, I trust this, this is my favorite person to represent me, public advocate, whether they're an existing politician or whether they're, you know, a journalist, investigative journalist you really like, or a professor that you studied with you really like, or a friend or a family member you really like, or the point is it's your decision. And you always are in control of that representation. So if they're no longer living up to your expectations of them, you don't have to wait four years and hope that they lose. Right then and there, you can say, you know what? I don't think you're actually representing me the way I want. I'm gonna change my representation to these other people. And so the point is just at the heart of it, you are in control of your voice, whether it be directly or via your representatives in government. So it sounds like there's a couple, a couple pieces there. One is the technology, which is, um, as you're describing it, being able to kind of participate in democracy from, from your phone. Um, and then the second piece of it is this liquid democracy concept, which almost seems like a kind of a, a mix or like a middle ground between our system, our representative system and, and direct democracy. Is, is, is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the way that I frame it in my own mind is like democracy is an evolving idea. Lincoln in, in the Gettysburg Address has this beautiful line about the unfinished work of democracy. We will not forget the people who sacrificed here for the unfinished work of democracy. And so at, in this evolving idea, I think of as like the earliest form of democracy was this direct democracy model, you know, ancient Athens, it's really only really rich people that have slaves to take care of all their business. You have the small landholders who are able to gather in the Agora and represent themselves directly. And that's a few hundred, maybe a few thousand people, but everyone's literally in, a, you know, in the same physical space together, gathered together. So that I think of that as like the first version of democracy. Then around the very beginning of the industrial age, you have this movement towards this elected representative democracy of what we think of what we have now, like 1776. We as this community, mostly farmers, you know, 90% of the population is farmers at the time. We need to stay here, you know, far away from wherever the, the government is making the decisions. And so we're going to pick one among us to be our representative and they're going to go off by horse, you know, it's a multi-day journey and they're going to try to represent our community as best as they can in in government. That's version two of democracy. And that's taken off in many ways around the world. And yet at the same time, you see this incredible tension that it's having recently in the last few years, in the last decade, where there's just widespread skepticism and lack of faith. 
as our world has evolved so much, as our population has exploded, our, our population is much higher than it was when these systems were developed. And so many more people are connected. We're all getting these breaking news alerts and we're doing so much stuff in this connected way, but we're not representing ourselves as a community in this connected way. So now we have this opportunity for what I think of as version three of democracy, which is if you want, you can always represent yourself directly. You can push a button and vote for the stimulus bill or against the stimulus bill. And just like on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, you know, pick your favorite digital tool, you get to pick the people that actually populate, that actually you trust. So just like on those newsfeed apps, you say, these are the people that I want to see the news from. These are the people that I want to see photographs from. These are the people that I want to see music from, you know, just like in any of our things, we live in this world where you get to design it yourself. But in our government, that's not true at all. We're still stuck in this 250 year old way of thinking. So in the new way, it's like you get to, you get to also mix and match. And the really powerful opportunity, taking it even a step further, is that you can break it down on cat issue by issue basis. So there are some issues that deal with criminal justice policy. You know, that's all over the news right now as we have all these riots and, and protests and, and demonstrations and lots of debate about criminal justice policy right now. And so there are some people that know a huge amount about that topic that you trust more. Separately, there's issues of foreign policy. And there's going to be different people that that's their expertise. Separately, there's issues of economic policy or tax policy or science policy or, or the, the Congress. If you go to congress.gov, they already divide all the issues into thousands of different categories. And so in the same way, um, it seems like a far more um, knowledgeable way of representing us would be to say, these are the people I trust for these categories, and these are the people I want to res represent me on other categories. That's how I think about it. That's an incredible, uh, an incredible vision you're painting. It seems like a lot of people's frustration now with the current system is that it doesn't seem responsive. It doesn't seem like it's representing what people want. It's not effective in a lot of ways. So that seems like uh, a different approach. And like, you, I mean, you made the great point there that, you know, the system that we've been using now has been going on for, you know, hundreds of years. Can you talk about um, how the, in, in the United States in particular, how kind of the number of representatives um, at, the, at the founding, um, relative to the population has changed over time. And, it, and do you think that that has an impact on the way that the system functions? Yeah, I think you're teeing up a softball for me. This is, this is like such a grand slam of a, of a question as I mix my sports metaphors here. Um, yeah, this is like this amazing thing that the vast majority of people um, haven't, aren't aware of, unfortunately, but it, it just makes this, it really puts this in perspective. So, um, Right now, like today in the year 2020, we have, uh, let's just look at the national level, for example. We have 435 voting members of Congress, 100 senators, and a population of, I think it's like 320 million Americans. So on average, that means that each member of Congress, each House member represents about 700,000 people. And we, we reallocate where the House members are so that it's always about 700,000 people. The Senate is stuck to two per state. So some senators represent far more people than other senators. And the California senators are very diluted from the Wyoming senators. For, but that's, that's a whole separate story. But just looking at the House members who are supposed to represent all people equally in, in theory, 700,000 per House member. That's I mean, I, there's something about that that I just find out of my mind insane. How, how could one person effectively represent 700,000 people? I mean, I have difficulty knowing how to represent myself sometimes, let alone, that, you know, there have been times that I've lived with a half dozen people trying to get all of us on the same page. Now you're trying to expand that to hundreds of thousands of people that all have very different priorities, lives, concerns so on and so forth. So it's just, I mean, I think it's, it's like inhumane in the sense that it's just not a human scale. It, it puts this 
absolutely incredible pressure on these people that that no human could could really meet all that effectively and it's so locked in and so to your to your question what's the history of this so when the country was founded there were the number was about uh 20,000 or 30,000 uh, citizens per representative so the country in 1776, it was about a million people and or it grew really quickly in the first few years from like a million to 5 million, but it was, yeah, it wasn't that many. And, um, and there were far less than a hundred members of Congress. And there was a big debate about this. The, the crazy thing is that this is, so the Constitutional Convention was when the, the framers of the Constitution were trying to decide how are we gonna set up our system of government? And George Washington presided over the Constitutional Convention. That's what made him the first president. And in general, George Washington was famous for not really weighing into issues. He's a military guy. He wasn't really, he didn't really get involved on policy issues that much, but this was the single issue that he spoke up about. This one issue, there's this big debate about how many constituents we should have per representative. And he said that this was an extremely important issue to make sure that we don't fall back into tyranny. And there are all these incredible quotes from the framers of the constitution saying this is arguably the most important issue to prevent us from falling back into tyranny. And so as a result of this debate, this is all in like 1787, as a result of this debate, after the constitution was passed, the, original, the first version, they wanted to amend it. What we think of now is the Bill of Rights were the first 10 amendments to the constitution, additions to the constitution. And the very first Congress, the very first item they passed in 1789, I think we're in now, was what was called the Congressional Appropriation Amendment. And it basically said, we will add a new member of Congress for every 30,000 citizens. And then once we get above 100 members of Congress, we'll add a new member of Congress for every 40,000 citizens. And then once we get above 200 members of Congress, we'll add a new member of Congress for every 50,000 citizens. But that was, this was passed, the very first item passed by the US Congress. And it was meant to be the first amendment. What we think of now is the first amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of press. That was actually the third thing that the Congress passed. But this bill was passed by the first Congress. Then it needs to go to the states and be ratified by three quarters of the states. And there were 13, 13 original states, 13 original colonies. And eight of the 13 passed it, but they were one short of getting that that three quarters needing to make it. And there's like this, this uh, historian that went back and found this record from, I wanna say it's New Jersey. I can't remember which state it is now, but he went like deep into the bowels of the like library of the state house and found that one of the other states actually did try to pass it on their floor boat, they passed it. But then the messenger who was supposed to, the, the guy riding the horse who was supposed to take the news that they passed it to Philadelphia where the capital was at the time, got lost on the way. And so they had never heard that it passed. And there was this other like crazy thing about this grammatical confusion where the version that Congress passed had the word, there will be no more than 30,000 um, citizens per representative. But then the version that some of the states passed said there will be no less than 30,000 representatives where one word got switched. And so there's this weird confusion about like, how do we handle this? The point of all this is, is that it's not a law right now. Right now we have 700,000 constituents per, per representative, but the framers of the constitution said it was incredibly important that we have a, a more balanced number that representatives can only do their job if they feel closer to their community and so what we have now is not at all what they intended and it's totally grown out of control. And in particular, the reason it's stuck at where it is now is because of a law that was passed and I think it's 1915. There was like a Congressional Apportionment Act of 1915 that 
the members of the house said, okay, we've been, we've been adding more and more members, keeping faith with the spirit of the original design that will we'll add them as our population is growing. But then they were like, okay, we're starting to run out of room here in the, in the building, in the actual capital itself. We're just running out of space. So we're going to stop it here at 435. We're just going to say no more. And so from 1915, we've been locked in at 435 as the U.S. population has continued to grow. I think it's, um, I can't remember the exact number, it's between like, I think it's around like six times larger today than it was then, which means that all of our representation has been diluted by like 6x. And all this, all this just means that yeah, that we just have less people representing us and that those representatives have less of a connection to the people they're representing. And one of the consequences of this is that we don't know these members of our community as well. And the actual act of running for office depends a lot more on raising money and buying ads and simply just buying mailers and buying TV ads and buying radio ads because there's no other way for people to know your name because we don't have that, that community level scale anymore. And so as it gets more and more diluted, there, there's, um, there's been another study that looked at all different countries. What is this representative ratio of how many uh, members they have in like their lower chamber of their national government versus their population size? That was charted on one axis. And on the other axis, they charted what is like the just self-reported level of satisfaction with government. And there's an extremely clear line that the more diluted it is, the less satisfied people are with government. And if you think about it, you know, you can kind of see the parallel, like there's a different level of fighting and there's just different level of representation on the local level versus on the state level versus on the national level. And none of them are free from problems, but you just, there's more of a community sense the closer you are. And so all of this just speaks to the fact that the current system was designed for a much smaller world and it hasn't kept up with just sim quite simply the population change of our current world, which um, I believe in, and many other people believe that a liquid democratic system can do a much better job scaling to effectively represent the world we live in today and the increasingly larger world that we're moving into. I mean, the world's not getting smaller as far as we know. So uh, yeah, I, that was a very long-winded answer to your question, but I hope that puts things more in perspective. That was great. And uh, I think you make a good point that the system has kind of uh, gotten progressively less representative of people, um, but it's just going to continue to get worse in the future, right? There's no there's no plan to kind of fix this. And I guess uh, at the beginning of the, of, of the country's founding, right, we were actually making the laws, we're writing the constitution at this point. Um, a lot of people feel like things are very, very broken and change needs to happen very quickly. I don't know that we have the ability to pass constitutional amendments um, on, on for liquid democracy to kind of get out in the United States in particular, um, just as an example of, of one country that this could spread in, would it take a constitutional amendment? What would be, what would the process be to have representatives using the system? Yeah. So this, this is the other piece of it that really caught my fascination early on was that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of systemic problems in government and government representation that people look at and point at, um, you, know, you can you can name all, all sorts of issues. And every single one of them has particular uh, solutions that people advocate for. Um, things like changing the voting system to like ranked choice voting or, or approval voting or other voting methods or changing the way that district lines are drawn to prevent gerrymandering or changing the way elections are funded to prevent uh, election things or, or changing certain rules to prevent two party systems. And there's all sorts of specific problems that people have identified and legislative systemic changes that people have proposed. The, I find it fascinating that this liquid democratic system actually suggests to have a solution for almost all of these. And on top of that, the other thing that really caught my eye is that 
the system can be experimented with on a small scale without needing to even pass any new laws. And that's what, you know, you were asking earlier about my race. That's what this idea of people running for office and there've been a dozen plus people doing it. I just got a message a few days ago from someone running for Congress in upstate New York. that's excited about doing this. All over the country people have been doing this. And the idea is you have advocates that already have learned about this, this possibility and want to bring it to their neighbors as an option. That's really all you're doing is just giving your neighbors the option to learn about it and to vote in favor of it. All you have to do is get your name on the ballot. You run for office and you say, if I get elected, I'm going to take on these new, this new way of representing people and be like almost a vessel for this new system. And that can, that can uh, be taken to an extreme. You know, one extreme of that is to say, every single item that comes before me to vote on, I will just follow what my local district's liquid democratic consensus is, no matter what. A much more um, like in between stepping stone way is to say, look, I want to engage the system on every issue. I will myself take part in it and I will, I will look to it and I encourage people to participate in it. I'm not going to commit to, full, to fully being bound by it, but I absolutely want to encourage more citizen participation and engagement and healthy debate and things like that. And so these are two different possibilities that, that we've seen lots of people um, take on and start to run as. And the powerful thing is that that can get started right now. And people in that are already elected in office right now have the option to start doing that. And so uh, that's where, where my organization was helping to build technology or is helping to build technology to make this incredibly easy, fast, basically free for everyone to start doing in a reliable way. Um, and people can run for office all over the place. And, and the act of running for office necessarily helps inform thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of more people about this possibility, just because it's, for better or worse, it's the best way that I've seen to date that these messages have gotten out there is because of the press you get from doing this sort of thing. So that is, is one of the things that makes me especially excited about this um, this new way of doing things is that this change can be made on basically a seat by seat basis without even needing to pass new laws. Not that it wouldn't be great to pass new laws, but that creates a really high barrier. The constitutional amendment is not possible right now. It's just not realistic right now. Um, but taking on a seat by seat basis is completely realistic and makes it a lot safer to try out because even to the extent that there are all sorts of unforeseen things that happen, of course, you know, it's an experiment, just like America, Democrat democracy is an experiment. It's um, limited to individual seats instead of the entire government I and mean, every other seat stays the same for now. So that's also yet another really, really powerful aspect of this whole work and this whole vision. It's almost like a Cambrian explosion of different ways of doing democracy, you know, tinkering with the, with the underlying rules of, of how it works. And it's, it's incredibly exciting as a vision. And I'm curious, so, uh, you know, the way, that, the way that our government is structured now, to some degree, there's sort of scales where there's local government, there's state government, there's, there's a federal government. Um, it sounds like what you're advocating there is the, uh, the ability at the at the individual seat level, whether that's local, state, or, or federal, to have your own sort of implementation of, of liquid democracy. And I understand you ran for local city council in San Francisco. Um, I'm very curious about local government as well. I'm curious, uh, just you know, to, your thoughts on what it would look like to have a local, uh, fully liquid uh, municipal government. Like, kind of what, what would that entail? What would that look like? How would people engage? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just, just uh, I wanted to run for local government. I ran for state government just because the, my local seat wasn't up for election in that cycle. 
Yeah, so I ran for my state, the state assembly seat. So, so just one experience from my election. So in order to qualify for the ballot, I had to go around and collect signatures. I get hundreds odd signatures of constituents of my district nominating me. Those are your nomination papers. And as part of that, um, I wanted to ask everyone, what do you think of the current incumbent? And the incumbent, um, not, not even to speak ill against him, like I, I, I mean, there's some issues that I t take some slight disagreements on. There's other issues that I think he does an okay job on, but he, um, he's been in office. I think he got first elected to this particular office in 2012. I was running in 2018. So he had been in office for six years already. It's two year term. So he'd been reelected three times already. And so I'm going around asking all my, all my neighbors, hey, will you, will you sign these nomination papers? Out of the hundred odd people I asked, what do you think of the incumbent? Not a single one of them knew his name. Hmm. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's, that's, that's like the, to me, that's, I don't know if it, it's weird because on one hand, you know, you could, it seems incredibly broken where you don't even know who your representative's name is, especially, I mean, so that just to put things in perspective, I mean, the state government, the California state government, it's, it's massive. I mean, it controls, I think it's $180 billion annual budget, operating budget, something along those lines. And um, yeah, I mean, it makes a significant number of regulations and and it's somewhat involved in people's lives. And the same thing's true on the local level as well. I mean, I, I've done this experience, you know, just sitting in a restaurant, sitting in a coffee shop and just asking people, hey, what do you, you know, do you know who your local city council member is? The vast majority of people have no idea who their representative is. So that to me seems like a problem for a system that claims to be based on like self-government and like voice of the people and consent of the governed and, and these really beautiful ideas of like um, free people living in a free society. Um, so just that it's hard. I mean, but again, this stuff is, this stuff is hard and it's complicated. And in many ways it's often um, like designed to be, like intentionally complicated. Like there's a lot of rules where there's just like, it's like almost designed to confuse people. And so I don't necessarily blame any individual person, whether it's the, the constituents that don't know their representative or, or the representatives even, I think it's just the system itself is failing everybody as a whole. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the simplest thing that I'd like to see is people actually know who their representative is. I don't, I don't feel like that's that much to ask, but that's, that's like a very slow starting place bar. To the extent that the people, you know, there's a lot of people that get involved um, in, in activism work and work to change laws in the way that they think will, will be better for the community, for everyone. Um, to the extent that these people can find their work more, um, a lot of times it can be like you pour a tremendous amount of energy into the system and you see almost no response or result whatsoever. So to the extent that the, the whole system can be a lot more responsive, that, would, that could also be great. Um, in general, I'd like to see people just feel a lot more satisfied and feel a lot more sense of community. I mean, everybody, so many people feel really isolated from each other and feel really disconnected. And, and there's just this like sense of like, oh, there's these politicians and like career politicians. And then there's like normal people or there's like everybody else. And it's like this two class system, which is not at all in keeping of the idea of like consent of the governed and like we you know we all are, are in this together sort of thing or just like a, a strongly uh connected community so i'd like to see a lot of those issues um addressed 
I don't think it's realistic for every last person to be weighing in on every last bill whatsoever. Um, one way that I, yeah, I mean, I think the vast majority of people will pick, set a representative and then probably not touch it again for many years. Just like right now, some people take the time to vote and then don't touch, you know, don't interact with the system again for years. A lot of people don't even vote. A lot of people don't, right now, you know, at the national level, we have like 50% voter participation rates. In some cities, we have like 5% voter participation rates. So like 19 out of 20 people didn't vote in the local election. Um, I mean, every, every city has different rates, but that's not that uncommon of a, of a stat. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, to me, what that speaks to is that the current system, the current way of doing things isn't offering any sort of compelling, exciting choices to, to these voters. I mean, in some cases there are issues with like voter suppression or being allowed to vote or confusion or things like that. And, and anything like that definitely ought to be cleaned up and, and sorted out. But I think from my experience, the far bigger problem is that most people don't identify with the candidates, care about the candidates, know the candidates, know why they should like the candidates. And just like the current offerings that, that we as citizens are being given um, for representatives is really, really, really weak. And so I like to see, yeah, I like to see a lot stronger options and, and much better leadership. I mean, that's really like, it, it's really legalistic to think of all this stuff as like, oh, who's the elected politician who's sitting in that seat, who gets to pass laws and all that's important, but a much more um, real way to think about this is just like, who is our, who are our leaders in our community? Who do we trust? And that's what the system is, is meant to do. And that's sort of how I think about it is that we have like an incredible lack of leadership right now and lack of trust. And there are, there are a few exceptions, but more often than not, they're like the exceptions that illustrate how, how bad things are in so many places. And so I think of this liquid democratic system as a much easier way to discover, to, to find the leaders and elevate the leaders to positions of much more relative authority and just make it a lot easier. Because the, the truth is we have, a lot of, we have a lot of people that have upstanding moral character, very trustworthy, respect in their community. But the idea of putting your name on the ballot and saying, oh, I have all the answers, vote for me, is terrifying for the vast majority of people. And dealing with fundraising for that sort of system is just not what most people wanna be spending their time doing. And the sort of attacks that this, that this invites is just not what, this, what most people wanna be doing. And so the point is that my belief is that we have hundreds of times as many potential leaders that we're not hearing from right now, that our current system just um, isn't really isn't really effectively um, empowering. And that's what I'd like to see from the future. And that's what I think is completely possible. And what we'll, what we'll get to as we transition more to this peer-to-peer -peer representative system. That's a hugely exciting vision. And uh, one of the questions that I have to ask, people are concerned with election security, 2016 election, uh, certainly, certainly the upcoming election as well. It sounds like there are, a, there are a ton of reasons why this system would work better than the one we have now. A lot of it's predicated on being able to use your phone to vote. So David, tell us a little bit about how you do secure voting on a smartphone. Where are we at now? Where do we need to go? Yeah, tell us more about that. Totally, yeah. Um... Yeah, it's incredibly important to get that right, of course. Um, of course, we want this to be as high integrity of a system as possible. And um, no system is perfect, whether we're looking at the existing digital systems. I mean, name a website, it's been hacked. Name a service from the government, it's been hacked. Um, even the National Security Agency's 
like billion dollar hacking tools have been hacked. Uh, that's a whole another story. So, and, and along the same lines, even our paper systems have been attacked. Even our existing election infrastructure is compromised. And the, in the um, very obvious sense of like ballots get lost, um, there are stories of like ballots getting destroyed or like thrown in, you know, thrown in the bay or um, ballot stuffing happening or all sorts of wild things. Um, at a higher level, you know, some people have made the metaphor that our politicians have been hacked, like their brains have been hacked because of the incentive system that they're um, relying on, like needing to please certain donors, needing to please certain special interests is like hacking their actual ability to represent us. So I, I just say that to sort of set some context here. Um, if we set our goal out to be everything needs to be perfect and hack proof, well, that's just not the world that we live in. I think the goals that we need to set are, um, is our system better than what we have right now? And is our system transparent when problems do happen? And does our system allow you as an individual to um, feel like your individual voice is, is being effectively represented? You know, you can, so, so I think all that is possible is the short answer. Um, there's, yeah, I mean, the, the fact is that our world runs on digital technologies right now. Every day, the stock market is trading trillions of dollars of financial assets all digitally. And so if someone's going to sit here and say like, oh, digital doesn't work, it's like, what are you talking? What world do you live in? Do you live 200 years ago? Or all of us, you know, the, all of our bank accounts are running digitally. Our entire economy is running digitally. Um, our military system is running digitally. So, so the point is, from just a first principles point of view, absolutely it is possible to build systems that provide levels of security and assurance and reliability. To be more specific about that, in the voting context, there's basically three questions that you're, that you're trying to address. That the way, this is the way I think about it. The first question is, um, are, are we confident that the right people are voting and the wrong people are not voting and the right people are only voting once? So just to make this um, the, the evocative picture is like, are Americans voting or like you know, Russian trolls voting from across the Atlantic Ocean or something like that? You know, do we have all these fake, fake people voting? Or along similar lines, like are some people being allowed to vote multiple times, you know, thousands of times or tens of thousands of times. So that's really the problem of voter registration. Um, do, do we know that the people that are voting are the valid people that are actually allowed, you know, they live in this jurisdiction? The next problem is at the, when I actually cast my vote itself, do I know that my vote is getting entered and counted and, and, and tallied in the final result without being changed? As in, you know, the, the horror stories are these stories of like, uh, I think it was in the mid 2000s, there were some voters that would like press a touch screen voting booth and they'd like press one name and the system would be like highlight the other name that they didn't press. And so it's just like, you know, you try voting for it and something else happens. So that's like the integrity of the vote itself. Voter registration, one problem. The vote itself is another problem. And then the last problem, which is really like the tension between, between these two, is um, what sort of private information am I leaking? A am I participating in this system in a way that's compromising my personal privacy? Um, we don't uh, we, but there's a lot of premises that we take for granted. There's a lot of things that we understand when it comes to voting about secret ballots and, and privacy like that, that we want to maintain. And the reason I, I say that that's the tension is because it's incredibly easy to knock out problem one and problem two if your system is entirely public. If you say that every vote that someone casts will just be published on a public list, 
it's very easy to, to make sure that um, the votes are getting entered and counted correctly. The challenge is to balance both the integrity promises with the privacy promises. And um, the short answer is that I absolutely still think it's possible. It does require some more advanced technical security work, the sort of work that like information security officers are doing and, and, uh, and so on. And in particular, um, yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's a complicated field. And so there's all sorts of trade-offs. A different privacy question is, is it okay if the voting, so right now we have these voting authorities and we have our voting registrars. And so they maintain the list of everybody who's allowed to vote and they collect all the votes and they run all the votes through their Scantron machines basically. And so we place a lot of faith in those systems. So it's quite easy to recreate all of that existing system um, where we still have these central parties. I mean, that, that's a relatively straightforward problem and there's lots of systems right now. You know, Facebook is doing its own registration system and you get to privately interact with this system and they can provide certain integrity guarantees. They're doing that for billions of users and Google's doing it and Twitter's doing it and lots and lots of systems are doing it. That's a very solved problem. The challenge, the thing that freaks people out about that, for rightly so, is that the voting authority sees all of your votes there. You know, Twitter, Facebook sees every message you write to other people, or so on or so forth. And so I believe that an even more um, liberty-infusing system or, or system for free people that, that don't uh, whether, you know, even if you're, you have a completely benevolent people running these systems, you don't want to create such a database. You don't want to create this honeypot that has everybody's voting histories and, and voting, uh, yeah, voting histories, because that just becomes this target for, for all sorts of things. And so the powerful thing is that nowadays there had recently, lately, there has been a lot of really exciting work in distributed systems and in decentralized systems and in privacy preserving decentralized systems. So all this is to say that yes, there have already been proof of concepts built in the election space and uh, working systems built and, and other spaces that do these, that solve these sorts of problems in a privacy preserving way. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a really important topic, but the basics is that there is math where you get mathematical guarantees that your system is, that your privacy is preserved. So you can, what it effectively looks like for the voter, um, well, let me just, just start over. The, the voter registration part right now, as far as anyone knows, has to be, continue to be maintained by central administrator. The way the current system is already being done digitally. That, the whole voter registration system is already digital. We're not talking about changing anything there. The part that we're discussing changing here is the actual casting your vote part. Um, so you can create, there are systems that have already been created where basically you as a voter are given a valid voter token by the voting registrar. You then are given the list of items that you're allowed to vote on. You craft your ballot and you basically seal your ballot with digital encryption. It's like, it's like taking your ballot and wrapping it in an envelope and licking the envelope and you can stamp, you know, you sign the outside of the envelope with your token and then nobody can see the contents of it. And then you can submit the sealed, the sealed ballot, and then all of the ballots get collected, and they can all be do what you call a verifiable shuffle, where they all get mixed together. It's sort of like the equivalent of um, you know, putting a bunch of pieces of paper in a hat and mixing them all together in a hat. And then after they've all been completely mixed, where you can't see the identities anymore, then you can unseal them. 
and you can tally up all the votes. And so this sort of system allows you to feel secure that the right people are voting, your privacy is being preserved, and the final vote totals, you know, your vote is in there. And you can even get, you can say that when you vote, you get like, um, the system that I personally favor the most is that you get like a vote ID, like a particular um, number or, or just unique, unique identifier that goes on your vote. So after they all get mixed up, when they, the votes all get unsealed, you can see your vote there at the end and you can feel confident that there's my vote. Um, it got entered and counted correctly and you can have an audit record and you can do what are called risk limiting audits where you check a certain percentage of them at random, you take a random sample and you can feel confident that the system works. And so this is, um, this is where some of the more like breakthrough cutting edge information security stuff comes along. And there's a lot of ongoing research in this space. Microsoft has this really cool system called election guard to do stuff like this. There's been a lot of work in Switzerland to do things like this and Estonia to do things like this. There's a lot of work going on in the blockchain space to do things like this. And so, yeah, it, it's definitely possible. And I personally hope to publish something quite um, in the near term future that makes it even easy, easier for people to understand how it works as well. So that this can, yeah, we can, we can push this whole thing forward. And so the system that I'm working on right now is called secure internet voting, the secure internet voting protocol, SIV. Uh, the Civ protocol. Yeah, it sounds like there's uh, there's a lot more to uh, to security than than people think, and there's a lot of new developments. Uh, the graphic space being being applied to voting as well. It's thanks for taking us through that. And you mentioned um, kind of as a segue to sort can of. I, my... Sorry, I, I hate to interrupt, but can I add one more thing to that? Yeah, yeah. I gave you the very complicated answer. I was sort of giving you the answer that's like the long-term ideal solution. Let me step back as well, just short-term solution. The current system right now, what we're told is, oh, write into your rep, email your rep, call your rep, tell your rep where you stand. And that's incredibly easy to recreate in a verifiable way. We've already been doing that um, with the technology we've built for four years now, and that many thousands of people have used it. Many reps have been using it. That's that we're totally good on, and there's there's a good amount of security guarantees there. Um, so that is totally workable right now for like stage one as we're experimenting with this. I was also laying out the vision for what even longer term idealized system can and ought to work look like. And as more and more people become aware of this, there will be more um, more experimentation and more technical expertise and more um, professionals that, that can really create and audit these systems in effective ways such that we can get a really secure thing. But it's absolutely possible is the short answer. Yeah, this kind of brings up, you mentioned Microsoft, you mentioned some work being done on this in Switzerland, the initial kind of liquid democracy uh, candidates or campaigns that I'm aware of started in, in uh, Argentina, if I believe there's been experiments in Australia, Spain and Germany. So it seems like there's a local level, there's a state level, there's a, a national level, and maybe something I'm excited about is potentially a kind of uh, a global, a global level of liquid democracy. Taking a step back, just as kind of a, a last question to, to give people some food for thought, where do you see the future of government and, and liquid democracy over the next five, 10, 50 years? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I mean, I, I think government, getting government right is incredibly important. It, it has all sorts of immediate effects in terms of addressing problems that we all face and uh, sort of criminal justice implications, you know, who gets locked up and who doesn't get locked up and making us feel safe. And there's a huge amount of money involved. I mean, it, just in the US alone, I think it's 
I think the number is 20% of every dollar spent in the US is spent by a government. I mean, it's one fifth of all of GDP. So getting it, doing it effectively is massively important. And then on top of that, there's all sorts of second order effects. So just when people live in a system that they feel like they can trust, visit more, more uh, the local economy flourishes. People feel more secure to do artistic, to take on artistic risks and take on entrepreneurial risks and, and do all sorts of things. I mean, it's sort of like, what's the saying? Like the fish rots from the head. You know, when you have a government that has some problems, that you, you those problems carry out all across our world. And so I think, yeah, I mean, I think our democracy here in the US is facing some very real problems and has been facing increasingly growing problems for decades now. It's not limited to any one candidate, although of course there are some really great candidates and some really terrible candidates. And yeah, worldwide, there are a lot of problems. There are countries that are in even worse shape. There's some countries that for now are in good shape, but have worrying signs. And yeah, I think in general, a lot of people have a lack of faith in the government. I personally take a very simplified view of what government ought to be. To me, government is the way that we just address our shared problems. You know, we're all trying to solve problems in our own personal lives, keeping a roof over our head, putting food on the table, developing as, as individuals. And government is the way that we as communities address shared problems. So to the extent that we have global problems, you, you raise this issue of global, global implications. I think we do have global problems, absolutely. And we could be doing a better job addressing them as a community. And there, there absolutely are um, all sorts of potential applications there in trustworthy ways. I think the thing that, that freaks people out about this topic is a sense of, oh, I already don't trust my national government. Now you're going to build an even higher, even more divorce, uh, even more separated body of insular bureaucrats or, or, or what have you, you know, people that I don't see or understand at all. I think that rightly scares people. It's like, if we already have something bad, we don't want more of it. And so the way that I think about it, I'm really happy to hear you're approaching it from the same way is like, can we sh show that this works from the bottom up? Can we show this works on the local level where we can see each other face to face? Then from there, we can grow it to the regional level or state levels. From there, we can grow it to the national levels. And then it, it becomes realistic to say, okay, this state has much more um, trustworthy governance and this state has much more trust or nation has much more trustworthy. You can combine them together in really powerful ways and have these uh, supranational bodies that people feel actual trust in and feel actual representation in. Um, so I think that's absolutely possible. My hope is that these ideas continue to spread. I mean, one of the biggest problems right now is just that the vast majority of people have never heard of this stuff and, and don't, um, know that it's possible. And so, yeah, I hope there's a lot more awareness happening. I hope there's a lot more experimentation. Um, as you mentioned, there's a lot of different things going on all over the world. That's really exciting. And I hope there's much more of that. And yeah, I mean, I, I hope people just keep discussing these issues. I mean, these, these aren't new problems by any means. Like what, what responsible, trustworthy government can look like goes back many thousands of years. In many ways, it's like, it's like one of the oldest questions that recorded humanity has been asking. And so I think as our world, as we've developed these incredible tools to, to reach each other in really powerful ways in such a drastic, to such a drastic degree just in the last 20 years, um, right now we have incredible potential to also bring that power to the way that we self-govern ourselves, self-govern ourselves and represent ourselves. And, but yeah, it's, it's an ongoing, you know, the unfinished work of democracy. It's, I'd love to see us make leaps and strides and push the world in a way that helps many more people flourish and feel trust in the world. And it's a lifelong work and, and generations long work and civilizations long work.
We've been speaking to David Ernst, a liquid democracy advocate, an innovator, and a friend of mine. David, thanks so much for taking the time. Totally. Love it. Thank you for doing this.